to the Lima for this conference. Uh, thanks to Kim and also to everyone who uh, is going to be talking. I had uh, some really great food last night and I'm learning. I should talk to Lima a lot more often. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what my current service is doing. Uh, mostly our investments uh, around the world, but we're here in uh, Silicon Valley. We're also in about 20 countries around the world. Uh, and then talk a little bit about some of the challenges we face in investing in emerging markets and some ideas on how that can be solved. Uh, I have way too many slides. These are online if you want to look at them. Uh, you can check my Twitter account for the link, which is twitter.com slash Um And I'll try to do 60 slides as fast as I possibly can. Okay, um, what is Fund Market Startups? Uh, we're a global venture capital fund. We do a lot of different things. Uh, probably most notably is we're likely the most active investor in startups in the world. We've done about 1,500 investments in the last uh, five or six years. Uh, a few of those are now dead, and a few of them might be worth some money. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we're also uh, very focused on Latin America. We've done Actually, over 100 investments in Latin America in the last five years. Um, the folks here, Santiago, we said Santiago, oh, Zavala. Uh, is our partner in Mexico, and Benji Yang is not here, but she's our uh, partner in Brazil and Miami. Uh, and I traveled here a little bit. Um, we've done about 107 investments, a very small budget, actually less than $10 million. Uh, we think that's worth about twice what we've invested, we'll see. Uh, these are a few of our companies that are doing well. I think actually we've got about 20 companies out of those 100 or so that are you know, probably at half a million to a million dollar remains. A few of them are actually, as you might notice, even that larger than that. Uh, and it would be remiss without mentioning Sina Papaya. And I'll try to do the commercial here. Wow. Uh, Woo! Uh, again, investors in Sina Papaya years, but actually this is the first time I got to visit the office uh, last night, uh, thanks to Gary. Um, and you know, they're really doing great, so I will kind of be very proud and easy to mention that our investments in Latin America are doing well, our investment uh, done before, I think, here in Peru uh, so far. If we get one out of four to this level, I think the odds are very good for Latin American entrepreneurs in Peru. Uh, so they've been doing great. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit more about kind of what our overall philosophy is. Um, so, uh, venture capital is probably somewhat new to Latin America in the last 10 years, most commonly, but it's been around for at least 50 years uh, in the US, probably even a little bit longer than that. But say starting in the 60s and 70s in particular, uh, probably with the passage of a lot of uh, mutual funds to invest in venture capital in 1975. Uh, there was really an explosion of venture capital that happened in that. Some of the roots of why that was happening were from defense and research spending that goes back as far as the 1930s or 40s. Uh, but there really was an explosion that happened in venture investing in the 70s, 80s that continued through the 90s. Uh, some of you remember there was a little bit of a downturn around 2000 and then around 2008. But in general, venture capital had been you know, progressing quite a bit. What's interesting about that is there's been a lot of very recent changes in how venture capital operates. Um, and I would suggest that for those of you who are sports fans, um, this is a very US-centric and a very uh, San Francisco Bay Area view of the world, so I apologize for not uh, looking at models in uh, football or soccer. But in American football, uh, the West Coast offense by the San Francisco 49ers, uh, baseball, football is a book and a movie that is very popular. Um, probably in the early 2000s, particularly focused on the Oakland A's. Um, and then more recently in basketball, for those of you who are Golden State Warriors fan, I'm from the Bay Area, my son's a huge fan, uh, the three-point shot revolution, maybe started 10, 15 years ago with Paul Westfall, but really in the last year or two has taken off. Um, all of those sports are probably over or about 100 years old, maybe basketball's a little younger than it isn't popular sport, but these are sports that have been around for 50 or 100 years. Those changes happened maybe just in basketball a few years ago, and baseball 10 or 15 years ago, and football about 10 or 20 years ago. Sports that have been around for 50 or 100 years had a dramatic revolution in how they were played and the strategies that came up with them 50 years after they were developed, in some cases 100 years, baseball 100 years. Baseball is a sport that is full of statistics. 
full of data, amazing amounts of data for hundreds of years, and yet the practice of the sport dramatically changed about 10 or 15 years ago. We're trying to do that in venture capital. So there's a traditional way that most people become venture capitalists. There's usually two ways. One is that they go to right schools, the MBA programs, uh, probably at Harvard or Stanford, maybe Penn or uh, Wharton, uh, a few others. They become an associate, then they may go work for a consulting firm, maybe for a startup, or rejoin as a partner, junior partner, and then we'll be on a great track. And if you're tall and light and went to the right schools and male, then that's probably a good path. But I'm kind of short, even though I'm white and male. I uh, grew up in West Virginia, so that wasn't really a right option. I didn't go to those schools. I went to Hopkins, which was a pretty good school. But, uh, the other option, uh, my friend Reed Hoffman and a few others have taken this, is that uh, you start a unicorn company. You turn that into a billion dollar company, and then you uh, don't have to sell it to the public, and then join as a PC partner, and they ask you. Uh, the other way is my way, which is wandering around Boston Valley for about 25 years. Uh, as an entrepreneur and marketer, and eventually you realize you're not going to get a job with any of those PC firms, you have to start your own. Company, which is what I did. Um, so I've been a geek, uh, mostly uh, an engineer, software developer. I was an entrepreneur, but not a very good one. The company that I uh, started in the early 90s, uh, mid 90s, I guess, exited for about a half a million dollars, which is really just like terrible. It's like, uh, that's about as bad an entrepreneur as you could possibly be. In fact, it's probably better if you bank up the company for a couple million dollars than getting an exit for less than a million dollars. Um, but I made some money for myself a little bit. There's some family and friends who put money in. Um, along the way, I got to work with some folks in PayPal. I got to start angel investing in some great companies. About three of the 15 companies that I was involved with had 100 million plus exits. And then I was at Founders Fund. I, I didn't get a job there, but I was a consultant for a year or so with Peter and Sean. Uh, and I invested in a few companies there, some of which uh, are doing really well. Um, but the lesson I learned for most of this was really that most of my investments failed. Most of my things that we invested in venture capitalists, probably less than 10% really failed. Uh, the mission that I kind of learned from most of this was really just to find smart people and give them money. Uh, and I'd say we wait for good shit to happen now. A lot of VCs think that they have impact on entrepreneurs. Probably 99% of the time it's the entrepreneur and not the investor. Maybe every once in a while we give an entrepreneur a good idea. Um, but there's probably a lot more that kind of is helpful uh, to entrepreneurs. Uh, this is a picture of our team uh, in Puerto Mexico from January. Uh, we're now about 125 people. Uh, we started with about five people five or six years ago. Uh, a lot of what we do, even though people talk about technology, is really about people. It's about us meeting other entrepreneurs, people that we think are intelligent, and giving them money. Um, uh, most of that group of folks is not tall or white, about half of our company is female, probably more than, more than a third or at least a third are not born in the U.S. and we speak about 25 languages. Uh, most of them are under 40. Uh, I'm kind of the old guy, I'm going to turn 50 this year. Most of them are in the 20s and 30s. Uh, we are all over the world. Uh, we're in about 20 countries, we invest in about 50 countries. Um, and I bring this up because a lot of the challenges that we have are in those markets. A lot of places, it's not Silicon Valley. It's not necessarily easy to find other investors, other acquirers, or a lot of the ecosystem that we have in Silicon Valley, or maybe in New York and LA. Um, this is kind of a list of, uh, I'm sorry to brag a lot right now, and I'll kind of explain why I'm going through this exercise, but in a lot of ways, we feel like a startup far more than we do a venture capital firm. Uh, we feel like we're kind of like a Series B company. We're probably going to do about uh, 20 million in revenue this year. We'll probably spend about 25 million in revenue this year. Uh, we have about 125 people. That's probably like, not bad for a five-year-old, five or six-year-old company. Um, along the way, we've invested in a lot of other companies around the world. And again, I think probably 20 to 30 percent of them might get to some kind of exit. Probably only five to 10 percent of them will get to a really large and meaningful exit. Um, so if there's one thing I want you to take away from my talk, it's probably this slide. This is kind of what I think about. If you wanted to get you know, one very large company, one to three very large companies, this might be you know, an IPO or a company that might be generating $100 million in revenue. My, my feeling is it probably takes about 1,000 startups to get to that one big unicorn. Now, I don't know if this is exact, but if you look at the numbers, it's kind of like a third of the companies at one level get to the next level. So starting with, you know, 
a thousand companies in your parents' basement or in a garage, which probably, you know, there's no investment, it's just them saving money and doing that. Maybe it's, you know, up to $10,000. Maybe 300 of those get an accelerator investment or an angel investor investment. Probably that's maybe only 10 to 50,000, uh, maybe even up to 100,000. Maybe 100 of those get to some seed stage level, 30 of those get to the series A and B, and then we start getting to the companies that venture capitalists really care about. Um, now, unfortunately, it probably takes three or four years, maybe even five years, for companies to get to that you know, $10 million in revenue standard stage. And it probably takes, uh, you know, maybe 90, possibly even 900 other dead companies or other companies that don't get to those levels before you find them. So, I consistently go all over the world and I hear investors talk about entrepreneurs pretty much in very disparaging terms. They, they talk about them like, our, the best, our entrepreneurs aren't good enough, we really need to develop them more, they do a lot of mentoring, they're not as good as Silicon Valley, and it's all a bunch of bullshit. It's a bunch of bullshit because actually the weak link in each of these environments is consistently, consistently the investors in those environments. The investors are the ones who do not take risks. The investors are the ones who do not have imagination. The investors are the ones who do not have experience. The investors are the people why these ecosystems are not growing. It's not the entrepreneurs. Cinema Maya is a company in Peru with very limited access to capital, going $10 million a year in revenue, and they're kicking fucking ass. Three to five years ago, no one was going to put money into them. What's your problem, investors? Are you idiots? Because I think you are. It's Woo! not the the hard work. You don't want to go look at a thousand to three hundred companies in a garage or an accelerator. You don't want to invest in those hundred to three hundred companies when they're at an accelerator and seed stage. You don't want to take any risk until it gets to maybe three to five million dollars in revenue when they're profitable. And then you want to take half the company. You want to make sure there's other investors. You'll screw with the entrepreneurs for three months. You'll wait until they don't have enough money so that you can fuck with them and get better terms. You're assholes and you're idiots. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't feel excited. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's not your fault. You know, you're just like anybody else in Westville. I'm not ripping about Peruvian or Latin American investors. And the same thing happens in Cleveland, Ohio, as well as other parts of the world. I grew up in West Virginia, and I guarantee you, probably angel investors in West Virginia are just as stupid and a bunch of assholes as you folks. <laughs> <laughs> the challenge is it's very difficult to do investing at early stages. Most things you do will fail. How many of you want to invest in 100 companies, 80 to 90 of which are going to be a fucking waste of time and never amount to any dollar return for you? And maybe if you're lucky, 5 to 10 of them might return money in 10 years. How many of you want that job? How many of you are investors in the world? Yeah, you're too scared to fucking raise your hands now. <laughs> That's what's been quiet. I've done it. Santiago's done it. We made 100 investments in Latin America for the last five years. We've got 20 companies that are kicking ass. Three of them, three to five of them, they're worth a shit ton of money. But you have to do the work. Or you have to wait for those companies to get there. But the thing is, if everybody's waiting, they're never going to get there. If nobody's doing that work at the accelerator level, at the seed state level, and at the series A to B level, there's never going to be any fucking companies in that fund. If Cesaro Lopez doesn't put money into the funds, they put those, they're not going to happen either. And even when she does, sometimes those folks sit on her ass. So I have a little idea of this. This is the point that I'm making. It's tough. It's very difficult to make money. It's very difficult and it takes a long time. Okay, so in Silicon Valley, life is pretty good. We have lots of entrepreneurs, we have lots of companies going to acquire, we have lots of angel investors, we have lots of VCs, life is fucking easy. Now the investors in Silicon Valley think they're better than everybody else in the world, but really, probably the worst. <laughs> because conditions there are very fucking easy. There's lots of liquidity, there's lots of investment, there's lots of entrepreneurs. It's fucking easy. But doing an emerging market, that's tough. So our mission is not just to find smart people and give them money. As simple as that is, and as untargeted that is, there's a lot of other things that we need to do. Particularly in emerging markets, we need to develop the investment side of the ecosystem. Far more 
than the entrepreneur side. Entrepreneurs, you just give them money and wait, they'll figure shit out. Investors, you give them money, sometimes they still don't figure it out. So we need investors at each of those stages. We need education on the investor side as well as the entrepreneur side. We need liquidity, we need exits, we need a variation of those folks who operate at corporate, uh, at uh, angel and private levels. There's a lot of challenges. Investing in Mexico and Brazil, two of the largest countries in the Latin America area, there might be three to five active Series A investors in those countries for 300 million people. That's far too few. In the United States, for 300 million people, we have about 500 to 1,000 investors in that Series A. So I'm probably going to have to skip a lot to get uh, major points here, but I think what I'm trying to get to tell you is that far too many of you think that the entrepreneurs are the problem. It's really mostly the investor side, access to capital, capital being deployed at early stages, and in particular, liquidity. Exits and partial exits and other methods of getting some form of liquidity early in that cycle. So quickly, a few things about building tech startups. Now, a lot of venture capital really hasn't changed in the last 40 or 50 years. A lot of company building you know, maybe still, still seems to be the same way, but I will tell you that building companies is dramatically different now than it was even just five to ten years ago. What is it that's different about building tech startups today than five to ten years ago? Cheaper. Faster and cheaper, definitely. Anything else? About three billion phones, about three billion smartphones around the world. Probably only one and a half to two billion smartphones, but probably three billion, maybe four or five billion phones. And in the next few years, there'll be probably six billion phones and probably three or four billion of them in smartphones. That's actually what's changed. Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Android, Xiaomi, WeChat, Snapchat, these are what have changed. Our connections with the rest of humanity, whatever language we speak, this is what has changed. It's actually not so much the technology, it's access to people around the world that has changed. Why is that important? Why is that important? You didn't think this was going to be a lecture or a lesson this year for school. Why is that important? Because they're customers, because I can get access to them online. The technology is very important, but the ability to market and access customers online is incredibly important. That, in addition to the reduction in cost, is why it's very different from the start. The things that used to cost millions of dollars in several years can now be done in barely tens of thousands of dollars and weekends. Right? This is what's different. That big flat dinosaur startup that used to cost $10 million to $20 million to get off the ground now can be built probably in a couple of months, at least the initial prototypes. And probably for far less than several millions of dollars. Now it still might cost a lot more to build it in the later years. But those first year or two can be done, usually in a million dollars or less in the US, and probably for a hundred thousand or less in emerging markets. The second year might cost maybe a quarter million to two million, but it's still it's very, very cheap to do it. Now you're still gonna fail a lot, but the large sums of capital were required for venture 10, 15, 20 years ago, not required in the first year or two. And what's happened is an explosion of companies, an absolute Cambrian explosion of companies. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of startups being created every year for pennies all over the world, not just in the US. Every corner of the planet, startups are being created. Even places that don't have consistent internet access have startups. There is no lack of talent around the world ever. Ever. And when it tells you that, it's full of shit. They are stupid and they should not be invested. People are smart and talented all over the world. It doesn't matter whether they're white, brown, black, yellow, red, purple, female, male, old, young, gay, straight, whatever. It certainly is not limited to white males over six foot tall who went to the right schools and lived in Silicon Valley or any place else around the world. And in fact, usually, investing in women and minorities is a better bet. You're arbitraging fact that everybody else is being racist and sexist and getting those companies that lower prices. Anyway, I'll stop yelling sometimes. <laughs> so let's think about like what do these changes mean for investing? Well it means we can be a lot more aggressive about investing in early stage startups. And we'll probably still fail a lot, but the cost of that failure is dramatically lower than it ever was before. And 
the speed to figure out which companies are working is also much faster. So that hundred investments might have taken five years to sort of see how long they're, they're taking, but now probably between six to 12 months, we'll know the top 20%, and another six to 12 months, we'll know the top 20% of those. So that, that investment and the progress by entrepreneurs happening faster and faster at lower cost than ever before, and the ability to reach customers is much, much easier than ever before. However, there's a lot of failure that happens between getting from idea to product, and from product to first set of customers. So those two things, getting a product out the door, getting an early, minimal set of customers, are still critically important. Those are largely the due diligence that we do when we're looking for investments. We want to know that that team can build a product and can get customers. Really kind of very simple. What we talked about first, they have a functional product. They have customers. Pretty much you can determine that those two facts within the first 30 to 60 seconds of the conversation if they're not lying to you. Then you have problems with then you might have scale, then you might have all these other potential things happen. But our job, in my opinion, is to invest as early as possible in the companies that are showing you some proof that they are not idiots and that they can get products out the door and they can get customers. This is not when they're going five to ten million dollars in revenue. This is probably when they're having, you know, maybe only five to ten thousand dollars in revenue. When they're enterprise companies, maybe only one to three pilots. If they're going after small business customers, it might be between 50 to 100 customers. What you're looking for is entrepreneurs who can get functional products out where the customers are not accidental, where it's not their mom or their friends. And at that point, even if they've got really kind of crappy process, there's evidence that something is working. And so because of that, we do not ask for business plans. We do not ask for revenue projections. For those of you who are asking entrepreneurs for these things, you should realize that you are encouraging them to lie to you. Do you understand that? Because that's the behavior that you're teaching them. You want to understand what the five-year revenue projections are? You might ask for five-year expense projections. Then they might be less likely to lie. Probably one to two-year expense projection, actually. So if that's the way you want to begin the conversation with the entrepreneur, that's fine. But that's not going to tell you whether they're good at doing the things that can create a successful business. The things that will tell you that are whether they've got experience currently that are working. Do you have any functional prototypes? Do you have any customers? Do you have any data on how those customers behave? Or the users who become customers, how they behave? Do you have information on churn and statistics? Can you show me the last three to six months of revenue? Is it growing, right? Just look backwards and see if it's growing. So the things that we focus on are really very simple around functional products, maybe around the unit economics for that business. What does it cost to produce that product? What does it cost to get a customer? Can you scale that up? Right? And in particular, can they do that quickly and analytically, and possibly even using online methods? Online methods. Right? Because that's what's really interesting now about businesses, is that if you can get the basic unit economics and the basic customer problem solution right, if you're differentiated from the competition a little bit, and you can do online marketing, you can scale without having necessarily to scale a lot of your team. That's what's really interesting about businesses these days. With a very basic functional product, maybe five to 10 people on your team, you can scale a lot of the work. And some folks actually are successful in doing that. Um, I'm not gonna to talk too much about the change in venture capital, except to like walk you through some of the stats. Um, basically, there's still lots of people raising tons of money in venture, and there's still lots of people investing very, very large sums, even though the requirements for building products have come down and the costs have come down. So well, the thing that I'd like to address for you is that failure is still hot. Startups are not real estate. Right? Now that's probably quite obvious to you, but the reason I'm trying to make that analogy is because most of the people who invest in startups probably come from real estate. Right? And they'll think about making investments in startups like they think about real estate, which is they might do one or two a year you know, put a lot of their money into it, and then it fails, and they think, well, this is part of it, it really isn't working. In, in real estate, most of your investments go to zero in about a year or two. Right? Most of them probably grow modestly over the course of the next couple of years. But most of them, most of the real estate investments also don't go to 100x in five years. Right? So the profile of startup investments are typically that most things go to zero, but a few things grow to 10, 20, 50x, so I wrote a blog post called 99 Problems, but a bash in one, with apologies to Jay-Z. 
And this is very simple mathematics. You know, people call it what we do spray and pray. It's actually probably just a simple uh, application of mathematics to the investing area. That we're not just basically show that if you increase your portfolio size from five to maybe a hundred companies, your chances of getting a two or three x return uh, substantially increase. And if we look at this another way, how many of you think you can find a unicorn uh, out of your portfolio? These the numbers are one, two, five, ten percent per zero. Uh, I won't bore you with the answers too much. The answer is one percent, at least according to CD insights. One percent of Series A and C investors, uh, excuse me, one percent of the portfolio of Series A and C investors get to a billion dollar valuation within five years. So those VCs in Silicon Valley who think that they're so amazing, out of 100 investments, one of them turns into the target right, in five years. Now, if we built a mathematical model and suggested that, okay, maybe really smart VCs get unicorns 2% of the time, and you might get a large win that's not a unicorn maybe 5% of the time. You know, what does that model look like? Well, actually, it looks pretty good. You might get a 2.4 uh, return, depending on you know, the time frame on that. But the challenge is if you only invest in 15 companies, you're likely to get zero of those unicorns or large wins. And so although the potential return might be 2.4, the actual return is probably less than one, substantially less than one. If we double the size of that portfolio to 30, now we probably have a guarantee of at least one large win. We might not have a guarantee of a unicorn. And only when we get to maybe 100 companies do we have some you know, mathematics and predictability around our ability to invest in unicorns. Right? Which is not crazy, right? If we find a unicorn 1 to 2% of the time, how many companies do we need to invest in to get one? Well, probably at least 50 and maybe 100, which you really want to be sure about. So there's, there's nothing that's very complicated about these numbers. There's nothing very complicated about this strategy. The only thing is that it takes a lot of work. Again, most people don't want to invest in 100 companies in five years or 100 companies in one year. But that dramatically increases the chances of having a successful portfolio. In our first fund, we invested in about 265 companies. Uh, right now, probably about 20 of those companies are valued at 100 million. One of them is valued at a billion. One of them is valued at 100, uh, 600 billion. Uh, 600 billion so out of the 250, roughly 260 companies, 20 were a little under 10 percent, got to 100 million, and two got to a, a half a billion or more. Right. So we had to invest in 200 companies to find those two really big outliers and those 20 medium-sized outliers. So now, kind of grabbing this all together, what I would like to convince you is that um, for any of you who are investors, take the size of the check that you're typically writing and take one zero off the end of it. If you're writing million dollar checks, write hundred thousand dollar checks. If you're writing hundred thousand dollar checks, write ten thousand dollar checks. But write ten times more of them than you're doing. That's really it. That's really simple. Look for when people have functional products and customers. Again, yeah, pretty simple. Don't ask them for revenue projections. If you want to ask them for the historical revenue of the last few six months, ask them for unit economics. And ask them whether they're doing A-B testing with the products that they're building and what their thoughts are around customer acquisition. How would they think about marketing spend? How, what kind of channels would they look for acquiring those customers, whether they're online or offline? And do they have a sense of customer acquisition costs and revenue generated? And what's the timing of that revenue and expense look like? And then make a lot of little bets with the expectation that probably 80% of them will fail, maybe 90%. And that maybe 5 to 10% of them will be interested. So that's basically what we do. We make a lot of investments. Last year we made about 600 investments. Um, we'll expect that maybe 100 of those 600 investments will be interesting. And probably you know, around 30 to 60 of them will be $100 million companies. And if we're fortunate, maybe 5 to 10 of them will be unicorns. Right. I'm pretty sure I, got, I invested in five to ten unicorns last year. The only reason is because I invested in over five hundred companies. So thinking about that, what does lean investment kind of mean? Well, it means we think about product, market, and revenue. In the product validation stage, we're really just trying to figure out, do we have a product that's interesting to someone? And in fact, we don't really even want to invest in it. We want the entrepreneurs to kind of do this themselves, either on savings or friends and family money, it may not even cost them very much money. Can you build a product that someone wants to use a pay for? Many of them will fail, a few will succeed. Of those that succeed, now maybe we might start doing seed stage investing, 
And what we want to know is how big is that market, how much revenue can be generated, and when does it kind of come in? Can we scale this to a large enough size that's kind of interesting, and can we see monetization? Sometimes we don't always need monetization. Sometimes we're really just looking for customer usage, but you know, the emerging markets money actually matters sustainability and matters as well. So out of those, again, we might get some companies that show, okay, the unit economics look interesting, the size of the market might be interesting, um, looks like you know, we could put some money into this and maybe have a shot. And then this is where venture comes in. Right now we want to grow the companies, scale the business, we want to really start putting million dollar checks in, you know, maybe we get to an IPO, maybe we get to a large acquisition, uh, but something looks interesting. Now, most people love this part. And a lot of people love that first part, because this is all about the story of the guys and girls in garages and basements. But what's most interesting is this middle part. This is where you're actually starting to get interesting metrics on the business. You start to look at like mathematical pieces of the financing of the business. Uh, when does revenue happen? It's not some geeky story about building code. It's actually a relatively straightforward story about marketing and finance. Right? Do the financials look decent? Can I buy customers at some reasonable amount of money? Can I get revenue from those customers within a short period of time? It's a very straightforward equation, and you can see progress happening. Might not be perfect, but you can see progress happening. This is the most exciting place to invest, in my opinion. It's where the least amount of adventure, adventure activity is going on. So if I had $10 million, what I would do is I'd probably put 50% of that in first checks. Right? I'd write you know, 100 first checks at maybe 50K each. I could probably do that you know, 20 checks a year. That might sound crazy to some people, but for us, 20 checks a year is not really that hard. Do that for five years, and over a period of time, maybe I look at the top 20%, and I might write some follow up checks into the top 20% of those. Right? That's a pretty simple way for me to think about investing over five year period. It's pretty much what we did in Latin America. We invested about $8.4 million, we invested in 107 companies, we got 15 to 20 companies that generated a million a year, we got maybe three or four or five that are probably going to do five to 10 million a year or more. <laughs> On a relatively small budget, but a lot of effort. We've found great entrepreneurs in Latin America. Unlike many of you who think that there's shitty entrepreneurs in Latin America, we had no problem. Simply because we wrote checks. So, how can we make that easier for everyone? So, I think the name of our company really isn't going to be 500 startups. In another five years, I think we'll have 500 people working for our company, maybe even 1,000 people. Uh, I think we might even have 500 VCs. Now these ecosystem factors that you all think are required in Silicon Valley, actually the first one is the most important. Yes, money is important. Yes, exit is important. Yes, other probably the most important thing. Silicon Valley is far crazier than any of you. Most people in Silicon Valley are absolutely fucking insane. And I count myself among them. We all jump off cliffs and build the plane on the way down. That's what we call ourselves. Entrepreneurs, we can jump off cliffs and build on the way down, try and find a parachute on the way down. That's fucking crazy. I guarantee you, people who are Polynesians who jumped into the currents of the ocean with their kids and found Hawaii were also probably crazy. 99% of them probably died. But the few that did find Hawaii or found some other island had an abundance of food, of animals, of ecosystems. So this craziness that's in Silicon Valley is actually built into the human genome. It is essential. 99% of us live in our hometown, you know, marry our girlfriend or boyfriend, and never move. Right? A lot of my family, but my sisters and my father and other people probably never move more than maybe 200 miles from where they're born. Some of us go across the country, you know, crazy, trying to find new opportunities. Right? When one person jumps off a cliff trying to build a plane on the way down, that's stupid. But if you have a thousand people jump off the cliff, actually two to three of them figure it out. And the other 900 try to jump in that person's plane and get out that butt. <laughs> Sometimes Elon Musk happens, right? Now, I met Elon Musk in 1995. That motherfucker was crazy. <laughs> I talked to him. We actually did some work for him in 1995 or 6, I think, with one of his other companies. He was a crazy person. He had, he had a, a server in the middle of the floor. I think he had 10 people working for him. The server in the middle of the floor with the top open, that was his production server, and he called that server X. And we were like, why the fuck does he have a server in the middle of the floor open and somebody could kick it? Why was it called X, right? Later we found out he actually had the X.com domain. 
that play in the context. He sold that company for $300 million. He put most of that money in the next outcome. That really didn't work. He worked with PayPal. That turned into a huge outcome. He took that money and then put it into Tesla and SpaceX and Solar City. And now he's a genius. Right? 20 years ago, Elon Musk wasn't a genius. He was a stupid, fucking crazy person in Silicon Valley. But now we all worship him like he's amazing. I guarantee you, there's 999 other people who were just like Elon Musk 20 years ago, and they're still fucking crazy, and they're poor. I'm gonna wrap up. We live in a world of abundance. Now, you may not believe me, but we really do. There are lots of talented people in the world. There are lots of entrepreneurs, and there's really actually a lot of capital sitting around, but most of it doesn't go to those entrepreneurs. Right? What, do you, what do you call an entrepreneur? Lots of us say that you know, there's different things. I will define what I think that is. Someone who wants to start a business? Well, probably not. That's a lot of us. Someone who can run a business? Okay, that's a smaller subset. Someone who can run a sustainable business? An even smaller subset. But now, how about someone who can run a capital business that creates value and employs a large number of people? Well, let's suggest that that is a $10 million revenue business that employs 100 people. Would you say that that's an interesting business worth investing in? Yes? No? Yes? Yes? Why are all of you raising your hands? Why are all of you raising your hands? How many of you actually know someone? How many of you know someone? Who can run a $10 million business and employ 100 people? You probably all know someone, right? In high school or in school, you probably, you know, maybe you have 100 classmates, maybe you have 1,000 classmates. Wasn't there someone of those 100 people or those 1,000 people that was worth investing in, that could run a 100 person business and create $10 million? Well, I probably know a bunch of those people. I bet you it's actually five out of 100. But let's say it's only maybe one out of 1,000. We'll jump ahead here for a second. So how many people on the planet? Seven billion. Let's say one percent is entrepreneurial, that means 70 million founders. Let's say they live 70 years, they do a, well, at least one. So a million founders a year is the number that I have. At least a million founders a year. Now I want to give them a lot of money, I'd like to give them 10 million dollars, but if we're really conservative, we might say, well, let's only give the top 100,000 people a million dollars. That's still a hundred million dollar a year market. So I think there's a lot of potential for entrepreneurship. I think there's a lot of potential for VCs. I'm going to jump back to two things that I want to talk with Paul about here. So that startup ecosystem that is most challenging, those, those parts, this is where I get to like act like a bunch of the big bikini. See that stuff up there? That's what we really need to work on. <laughs> The accelerators, that was probably not the accelerator back there. The seed stage, startups, and the series A and B startups. That's the really hard stuff. And the investors put money into those. Right? That's the challenges that we have. And providing liquidity for those, investors, for those investors and companies are the challenges that we have, particularly in emerging markets. Now, there's lots of challenges that I think we are solving. You know, people say that you know, Latin is smaller than the US. Actually, that's you know, not really true. There's 400 million of Spanish, there's probably five or six hundred million people in the left hand market. It's plenty bigger. Right? There's been limited internet penetration, but that's changing. And in another few years, there'll be plenty of internet, uh, internet penetration. And probably payments and logistics are a challenge, those are getting solved. All of those first three problems, not really problems, and will be kind of taken care of for the next few years. The last three are still problems. There's not enough early stage capital for firms. Again, there's lots of money, but it's not being deployed. Right? It takes a long time to exit. Startup companies probably take seven to ten years to get some form of, of liquidity. You might get lucky and get some in three to five years, but the big ones take a while. And there's probably not very many IPOs, sometimes zero, right? And there's not very many local clubs. Now that last one might get better because global multinationals will start doing acquisitions. But those are the challenges that we have to face. Right now, how can we provide solutions? Well, the simple solution is just to write more small checks. Right? Increase the number and frequency of early stage investors and early stage investments. Increase portfolio size, decrease check size. That's actually going to do a lot of good. You may not believe me, but I think just deploying the capital we have in more frequent and smaller check sizes will dramatically increase the results and the performance of your portfolios. Now, things that we need to work on is can we create 
fund of funds that are really able to invest money in investors, but then invest money in startups, but focus those investors on the earliest stages. If we just give people $50 million funds, they will be lazy and they will deploy them in big checks. They'll do 10, you know, $5 million investments, maybe they'll do 20 or 30, you know, two or three million dollar investments, and they'll play golf all day long. And we're complaining about the lack of uh, entrepreneurial potential and the lack of development of that Right, so what we really need to do is mandate that they will deploy that capital in small checks in early stage companies that are still at those top phases. Right? They want to prove something, but we don't need to wait until they're doing five to ten million capital. We can also do things where we provide funds that are able to repurchase some of those investments as they are progressing. So the portfolios that are progressing and get to C or Series A or Series B, we might offer partial liquidity to those investors, plus even to those companies, as a way to show them progress. That will make it easier for them to raise advanced capital, easier for them to recycle funds. We can provide tax incentives for why they might want to redeploy that capital into companies in certain regional markets or areas. We can use real estate as a hedge. We can use all those real estate investors and say, hey, why don't we combine real estate with startups? We'll put half of the money into a building, we'll put half the money into startups, we'll work with the startups to pay rent to that building, and we might lose money on all of the startups, but the real estate might actually do that. We have some control over our real estate fate by the dollars we deploy in the places where we deploy. I'm not promising you that anything's will work, I'm just saying that we need to think about exits and liquidity. That is a crucial part of investing. And it's a problem for angel investors as well as VCs and also for founders. The funny thing is, it's a relatively ridiculously small amount of money that can solve this problem. For the budgets and the sizes of most countries, the amount of money necessary to get venture capital functional is really quite small. In the Middle East, I, I go to the Middle East quite often when I visit Dubai, and you see these huge hotels going up pretty much like every month. They'll build a new hotel that costs a million dollars. And I tell them folks there, like, build one less hotel and they'll fund the entire venture capital market for two years in the Middle East. Right. I'll let you uh, think about one of those things that I said. I hope that I've given you some optimism for why there's plenty of talent all over the planet. There's plenty of talent in Latin America. There's plenty of talent here in Peru. I've got the proof of it. See, here's this company. Right? And there's tons more just like it. You will just like checks. If you're in the government, think about how you can provide liquidity and opportunity and incentives for those investors to write more small checks and help them as those investments are proceeding. This is quite doable. You should be excited and optimistic. I am very excited and optimistic. I'm probably going to invest in 800 to 1,000 companies this year, at least 50 to 100 in Latin America. Susanna, so if I write a check, make that one less. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>